I thought about the kinds of things I could talk to you about, and I decided in this presentation to talk about carbon footprints because they're not as much of a physical thing. It's kind of a model, and we'll talk about that. But you guys get a lot of probably higher level engineering talks, and I wanted to give you something that maybe you could take away and apply at some level right away, and also show you that engineering is not always making stuff. It's also thinking about systems and processes. Okay. So we're going to talk about carbon footprints. And a nice thing about carbon footprints is that they scale to different sizes. Uh, but there are challenges to make them scale to different sizes. And we'll talk about how principles of science and engineering are used together. And you should have a better sense of what a carbon footprint is when you leave here. You've probably, who, who hasn't heard the term carbon footprint in the media? Okay, most people have kind of heard this. But it's, it's a little bit fuzzy. And sometimes people take liberties at, at what it really is. Everybody's trying to sell green products. Um, and, you know, sometimes they have good intentions and the product doesn't really live up to the expectations because, you know, they're trying to market you something and it may not be as green as people think it is. So we're going to go through and look at this. This is not intended uh, to be a lecture on global warming or climate change, but at the same time, if I'm going to try to convince you that you should be analyzing carbon across various scales, I need to convince you at some level that carbon's an important factor in this whole environmental impact. And you might not, you may have some skepticism about some of these models, and that's fine. But what I'm going to try to do is present you some data that's out there, which hopefully will lend you to uh, lend some credence to the fact that carbon is something we should be concerned about and should be measuring. And even if you don't buy into the whole global warming model, I think what you'll still find is there's useful reasons to do this carbon modeling independent of that. So this just shows, uh, this is a piece of science here. This says that we can measure and model the energy that comes into the Earth. So this is an energy balance. Okay, so 100%, if you just normalize the sun's output in watts and call that 100, we can look at where all that energy goes. So 46% of it, for example, ends up in the ocean and land, 4% absorbed by the clouds. Uh, you know, and you, you, can, you can model this, and you've got to account for all that energy because physics tells you that energy in has to equal energy out. You can't lose energy anywhere, so you've got to account for all of it. And at the same time, we've got energy being radiated out of the Earth. So we've got energy coming in and energy going out, and there's this balance. And in fact, if we didn't have this thing called an atmosphere up here, uh, the Earth would be very cold. The atmosphere holds in some of that radiation. It lets it out, but it doesn't let all of it out. And in fact, it allows this planet to be livable. And we can model, and these numbers look like they're exact, but there's, like in all engineering and science models, there's some variation here. So approximately, you know, 24% of this is latent heat that's transferred up into the atmosphere. So here's the key piece when people are talking about something called greenhouse gases, which I think you hear in the news a lot. Greenhouse gases absorb. Okay, there are things like water vapor, carbon dioxide, and ozone, and they absorb some extra of this radiation that wants to get out of the atmosphere, and they hold it in. Okay, just like a greenhouse has glass in it that holds some of the extra radiation in and keeps the greenhouse a little warmer than it would be otherwise. So this is what we're talking about here. These greenhouse gases are up, floating around in our atmosphere, and they trap radiation. We can go in chemical chemists and chemical engineers can go into a lab and, you know, for each different kind of chemical, they can measure how much heat they trap. This is a, a scientific principle that can be measured, okay? And that's how they get this estimate of 6% of the, the energy going out gets trapped by these. So that's that. The other piece is this. <clears throat> that was an energy balance. Uh, physics also tells you you have to conserve mass, right? You can't lose mass along the way. A pound of something in has to go out somewhere. So when we think about carbon as an element, okay, and carbon dioxide going out and being in respiration, we're breathing in oxygen and respiring carbon dioxide. The plants are doing the opposite, right? They're bringing carbon dioxide in and expiring oxygen. So this is, you don't need to know all these numbers, but what's happening here is this shows where all the carbon is going, and there's a balance. There's carbon going up into the atmosphere, carbon being sucked in by the plants in the oceans, Okay, and there's some balance here. And one of the things that people argue about carbon is, if you look at these, the red numbers here are the numbers that are purported to be human-induced from our activity. So here's a power plant here. And some fraction of the carbon going out of the system is due to this power plant. All these numbers in black 
are called numbers that are natural, right? Those are going to happen whether people are doing anything or not. The plants are going to continue to grow. Okay, so some of these are natural balances, and some of these are what are called anthropogenic. It means human-induced. And a lot of times people argue, well, because the red numbers are fairly small, look at this, 120 here, 120 in and out due to vegetation. Fossil fuels is only 6.4. These are gigatons of carbon, so lots of carbon a year. Okay, but sometimes the argument is, because these red numbers are fairly small compared to these big natural numbers, it really can't be making that much of a difference. It's this balance that's important, right? If you have a bathtub that's completely full of water and it has a hole in the side and you're letting water in the top, if you're letting water out the bottom at the same level you're letting water in the top, the bathtub will say exactly full. If this system is completely balanced with the natural things and we throw just a little bit more in, like turning up the tap water just a bit, the bathtub's going to overflow. And that's why carbon is building up in our system, because it used to be balanced when no one was burning fossil fuels. And now we're taking fossil fuels from down below the earth. They'd never get there. They're not part of the natural system. And we're burning them. So we're increasing the carbon on this end. So that little bit of a difference is enough to tip the balance. And it's the balance that counts, not the overall amounts. Here's some data, so more science here. We're going to do the science stuff first. We'll move to the engineering stuff. Um, this is the amount of carbon dioxide measured in the atmosphere at Mauna Loa, which is an observatory in the Hawaiian Islands. And it's been measured for the last 50-some years. And the red data is the actual data, and the black line is an averaged line. And the reason the red data is changing sinusoidally is because of the growing season. Okay. The winter comes and the carbon is not being pulled in by the plants, okay? But then the spring comes and it goes down because the plants are pulling in carbon to grow. Uh, but that at, at the end of the growing season, the leaves fall off and that carbon starts to go up because it's not being pulled in in the winter. So these sinusoids here are winter, spring, winter, spring, winter, spring, all the way up. But the trend you see that is absolutely measurable and verifiable is that carbon dioxide concentrations, so small amounts of carbon dioxide, 400 parts per million, so not a lot, that's the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But it's going up. <clears throat> this is temperature data. Um, you know, depending who's measuring and where they're measuring. This is land data. There's also ocean data. But this is four different places, NASA, Japanese Meteorological Society. And you see in general that these trends follow each other fairly well. They're being measured in different places by different people. So there's a little bit of air there. But the fact here is that global surface temperatures are rising. Okay? When people start to argue about what's happening in terms of climate change and global warming, they tend to think that if you can't predict everything about a model, then the whole model falls apart. Okay, what we're arguing about when people argue about global warming is how fast and how far this is going to go. And how much of this carbon is due to human activity versus natural activity. But there's no doubt whatsoever that carbon is going up, carbon does trap heat, and the temperature is rising. The real question is how fast and what are those impacts going to be. But sometimes people, because those impacts aren't fully known, we don't really know what's going to happen 100 years from now. We have some models. But because those are a little bit uncertain, people think that the whole thing is uncertain, that we really can't even measure carbon, or that temperatures really aren't even rising. And those things are not true. So a couple pieces on carbon. This is modeling data. Uh, I'm not going to go into details. but so, so the climate scientists have put these models together, just like the weather people have put models together that tell you what the likelihood is that it's going to rain tomorrow. And even though they don't get it right every time, uh, it's still better than just guessing, right? And in general, weather models get better over time. They're putting in temperature and humidity and wind speed, and out they come with a prediction of how much rain and when it's going to rain. This is the climate model. This is the temperature. There are two models here. The models in blue are models only using natural forcing. So this means only the natural things in the Earth are going on. No human-induced climate change no burning of fossil fuels, no cars riding around. And if you look at the models, and they're not lines, they're, you know, there's a, a, an area here because it's a little bit uncertain. The model says somewhere between here and here. The real data that we've measured over the last you know, 100 years is in red. And you see that in each of these cases, for different parts of the globe, 
for global land and ocean, if you don't add the anthropogenic piece, the human-induced piece in, you can't get the trends to follow. And when you do add the human-induced piece in, the real data always lies within the predicted error. So this is, again, some evidence, data, which suggests that the models saying that what we do on Earth really does matter for climate change is true to the extent that our models can predict them. And if we leave out that piece, it never matches up. It's always too low. Okay. The other thing we don't hear a lot is we hear, well, the model can't account for this one little bit, and the model can't account for that. As engineers and scientists, you need to know that that's the whole point of science is to continue to make models better and better, to predict things that we can't predict right now. So models are never perfect. And this just shows how much data there is. I mean, people pick and choose the kinds of things which don't match. And again, this is a very busy graph. The colors show the temperature increase across the globe uh, in the last 40-some years. The thing I want you to note is what they've done in North America, Latin America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, uh, polar regions, is they've looked at all the different studies out there including physical and biological systems, and they say, does that data match the climate models or not match it? Okay? That's just a simple question. And this shows the percentage of data. So out of 355 studies in North America, 94% of them match the climate models and 6% don't. And here, out of 455 studies, 92% match. If you go across, you see it's lots of data sets. Thousands and thousands of pieces of data match the models more. So when people say there's not a lot of data out there, uh, that's not true. But you can always find a few pieces of data which don't quite match the model because we don't understand everything fully. Last piece before we go on to the carbon footprints. When you take all this together, you can estimate how much impact all the different things cause in terms of temperature rise. And here's carbon dioxide, which we're going to talk a lot about today. Here's methane. Here's ozone. Down here is one that people say, you know, maybe some of this temperature rise is just due to variations in the amount of radiation from the sun. You know, there are, the sun isn't a constant output mechanism. There's slight variations, solar flares and things. But when you look at the data, the data only predicts that the solar variation has that small of an effect. There are also things which can reduce temperature. These are aerosols, little particles up in the atmosphere, which actually, as the sun comes in, they reflect them back out. They never even get into the atmosphere, so they cool. So when uh, Mount Pinatubo, for example, in Asia exploded, that volcano a few years back, it put a lot of carbon aerosol particles, and that cooled the Earth a couple of degrees for a few years. So those are negative, what are called negative forcings. But the biggest forcing is carbon dioxide and this is the human-induced piece. It's much, much bigger than the natural piece, the solar radiation piece. So just more data to try to convince you that carbon is worth measuring. Lastly, we talk a lot about carbon, but there are other compounds that are greenhouse gases. You can see in this, here are the compounds that are the focus, so carbon dioxide here at the top. These are measurements from history, mostly from ice cores. If you drill down into the Arctic and pull up an ice core, you can actually measure as a function of depth the concentration of different chemicals in that ice core. And based on how deep it is, you can predict when that happened in time. So we know fairly well before the industrial age, before the 1900s, how much of these chemicals were in the atmosphere. And some of these things, these refrigerants here, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluoroethylene, these are not naturally occurring substances. Nature doesn't make them at all. So before the industrial age, there was none of this in the atmosphere. Okay, and now we see these small amounts. These are parts per million, so very, very small amounts. So we're way below parts per trillion here, but they're still there. And this number out here is what's called the global warming potential. If I want to add up greenhouse gases, I have to relate them all to the same number of units. And we're going to call carbon dioxide one because it's the big one, and we're going to talk a lot about it. Um, but all these other ones, what this says down here is that for every gram of carbon dioxide or every gram of sulfur hexafluoride, it's equivalent to dumping 24,000 grams of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It's a molecule that really likes to grab heat and hold on to it. 
and it holds on to it better than carbon dioxide. In fact, 24,000 times better. So there's lots of other gases which really can warm the atmosphere. Luckily, we don't emit these gases in high concentrations. So what really counts is what the, con what the concentration is and what this potential is. And this depends only on the chemical makeup of it. Okay. So one of the questions we're going to ask now is why are we focused on carbon dioxide? And it's because if you look across the whole, uh, this is the US, all the greenhouse gas emissions, so you do surveys of big companies and you ask them how much material are you emitting, more than 80% of all greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide. And you can see the breakdown of the other chemicals as well. Okay. And so when you calculate a carbon footprint, you're not just calculating carbon. You're actually calculating these guys as well. But you're adjusting these as if they were carbon. So for every pound of methane you count, you're multiplying that by a factor of 20, because it holds heat 20 times better. That way, you can just report one final number. And they're all going to be related to carbon dioxide. Here's another thing that shows if you just look across the US economy, where does the carbon come from? 14% uh, from transportation, 15% from industries, 20% from power stations. What you see here as you look around this is that there's no silver bullet, right? Lots of people want to say, oh, if we just do wind turbines, if we just do hydrogen vehicles, if we just do nuclear power, if we just, if you look at all of these sectors, they all contribute, okay? So if you want to change power stations, that's fine, but even if you turn all the power into renewable power, you'd only knock the number down 20%. You've still got to deal with fuels, right? No wind power is going to get you your car any distance, right? Unless you turn that into a fuel that you can put in your car. So we've got all of these different sectors to think about. And this is where the engineering comes in. When you start thinking about nuclear power versus hydrogen cars versus uh, insulating your house, we can kind of estimate how much that will reduce these emissions. So that's the engineering piece of it. I'm going to design a car that uses less fuel, that's more efficient. And then the question is, well, how much can I get and how much does it cost me? Because right? some things will cost you more than others. So this is what we're going to talk about in more detail. This is US numbers here. The other thing to note is that most of the carbon emissions that you saw on the previous page come from burning stuff. Okay, And if you've had your basic chemistry classes, um, these kinds of equations will look familiar. If you look at coal, uh, it's not entirely carbon, but it's almost all carbon and a bunch of impurities. So it's a solid carbon source with some impurities, um, like sulfur and mercury. So when we burn it, those things end up in the atmosphere as well. But in all of these cases, we're taking some fuel with carbon and hydrogen in it, and we're combining it with some oxygen by combustion. We're burning it. And when you burn these things, you let the chemical energy out of the bonds, right? So there's a heat term on this side. You get these outputs, plus you get heat, which can be turned into energy, right? Steam turbines and various things. Um, so you can see here's coal, here's gasoline, which is not only octane, but it's a lot of octane. Uh, and natural gas is methane, OK? And the thing to note here is that we vary from coal, which is way down here, almost 100% carbon. And there are different grades of coal, right? Hard coal, soft coal. So that's why there's a range here. To gasoline, which is you know, eight carbons and 18 hydrogens, all the way down to here, which is pure hydrogen. And here's natural gas, which is 3 quarters of the way down, one carbon to four hydrogens. OK, so when you burn these, you can see the amount of carbon you get out varies by fuel. And if you burn fuels with less carbon and more hydrogen, you actually emit less carbon dioxide. So if we normalize this, we can say per energy units, per BTU, so now we've got the same energy units. If I burn enough natural gas to get 100,000 BTUs, I only emit 12 pounds of carbon. But if I do this with a gasoline fuel, I get 16. And if I do it with coal, I get 21. So this is the difference in your house. This is the same amount of heat for each of these. This is a natural gas furnace. This is an oil burning furnace. Oil and gasoline are going to be similar. And this is if you get your furnace from electricity, which in this region, the electricity is coming from burning coal, 88% of it at least. So there is this variation. And when you decide you want to calculate how much carbon you're emitting, 
you've got to know what your fuel is because it makes a big difference. If you go to Seattle, about 60% of the electricity in Seattle is coming from hydropower, which has almost no carbon and being emitted. Right? You're just taking the potential energy of the water and turning that into kinetic energy in a turbine. Okay? So this is all background. What are we going to do with this? Here's that piece about... This is um, Appalachian Power, which is our electricity provider, and American Electric Power. That shows blue. CERC uh, is the Southeast Regional Electricity uh, Council. And that says that in the southeast in general, from Florida up to kind of Maryland and over to maybe Tennessee, on average, about 40% of that electricity is made with coal, a little bit uh, under 20% from nuclear, and then these other sources. Here, in Roanoke and most of Virginia, except when you get to the very far eastern side, 88% of our fuel is coming from coal. A little bit from a few nuclear plants on the eastern part of uh, in North Carolina and in Virginia, and very little from anything else. Okay, and that changes. It means our carbon footprint in a city in Virginia is going to be higher than a carbon footprint for the same size city uh, in the Northwest, for example. This is an old slide. It's from 2008. Because of this carbon problem, you might have heard in the news people were talking about having this thing called cap and trade, which says that big industries are only allowed so much carbon to emit and if they want to emit more they have to buy it from somebody who's emitting a little bit less and those companies that invest in technologies that allow them to do less could get paid for reducing theirs so this was in congress before um, the economy went south and so this is no longer really on the table all of these these are all different people's bills in congress and there are these different lines all of these were trying to get, by the year 2050, an 80% reduction in carbon from this 1990 baseline. Okay. So here's what's been happening. The black line is historical carbon emissions in the U.S. Here's the 1990 number. The red line is what's expected to happen as our economy and our population and our GDP grows. And all of these are different ways Congress people thought they could get policies and incentives and plans to get the number down to here, which is where most of the scientists think we need to be in 2050, so we don't get too warm. Uh, all of these are now off the table. There's no real political will to get to these, but it shows you what we were trying to kind of do. So we've kind of stalled. This shows, if you've heard of the Kyoto Protocol, this is something that's an international uh, agreement that the U.S. did not sign, but we were given a target, and our target was to drop 7% below 1990 by the year 2012, which is next year. So it was kind of to do this, and we're not there. We're, we're still right up about here. We're, we're following this line. Virginia has an energy plan in 2007 which suggested that we should reduce to the 2000 level. So if you draw a line from 2000 across here, you get to here, by the year 2025. So that still requires us to drop this number significantly. We're still following the red line. Okay. So. All of that is a big preview to the question, if you want to measure environmental impacts, how much forest land is left, what's, how dirty is our water, okay, how much radiation is there out there in Japan due to this nuclear disaster, how much carbon is in the atmosphere. One of the questions from an engineering point of view is how do you measure that? Environmental impacts are kind of a fuzzy thing. So, this is one of the things we focus on really heavily in green engineering. It's something called life cycle and life cycle analysis. And it says that anything you can imagine, if we look around this room, nothing in this room came, I don't think, most rooms don't have anything that came directly from nature, right? You can't just go out into nature and get blocks or desks or chairs or carpeting. You have to extract some raw material, right? Oil, sand, wood. Okay, and you have to manufacture it into something, with few exceptions. If somebody had an apple sitting around here, that would be an example of something that needs no manufacturing. You extract it from nature and it's ready to go. But almost everything that we use on a daily basis has to be manufactured. And then when we manufacture it, many things need more inputs to be used. So computers need to be plugged in, cars need gasoline, this little clicker needs a battery. Okay, so we need more inputs. And then finally, at the end, we dispose of things. At some point, my computer will run too slowly, 
or it won't be as thin or as light as I want it. This carpeting will wear out. Okay, your clothes will, they won't be in style any longer, right? So all these things happen. This line here is the recycling line. You take it and instead of disposing of it, you go back and you remake something out of it. So you don't have to go back and get aluminum from the ground anymore. If you recycle the can, you go back to the can manufacturer and you make a new can. This is reuse, okay? This is taking a glass milk bottle and not melting it back down up here, but just cleaning it back out and sterilizing it and filling it back with milk, right? So that's reuse. That's even better because you don't have to manufacture or extract. And this line is only for biological materials. This is the compost line or the biodegradation line. So things that are natural, like paper, you could, in theory, bury it, put it in a compost pile, and it'll turn back into nutrients and materials that could be used again. So these are your options. And for all of these, we've got inputs. And almost all inputs turn out to be water, chemicals, resources, which are often materials, and energy. These are the inputs for everything we see. And then we have outputs here. We have products, things we're trying to make. So we're trying to make um, wood for a desk. We also sometimes have co-products, which is we're not trying to make it, but it's actually still useful. So when you cut wood to make floorboards, you actually get some sawdust. You're not intending to make the sawdust, but it's actually still valuable. You could burn it. You could combine it with some glue and make some kind of fiber board. So that's called a co-product. And then for all of these things, we have emissions. There is stuff that goes up into the air, stuff that goes out into the soil, and stuff that ends up into the water. And if we're trying to quantify what happens, we don't really care so much about what these outputs are. We do in a sense, but what we really care about is what they do. When they end up in these different places, all of these emissions either end up in the air, in the water, or in the ground. And when they do that, they can cause a laundry list of problems. I gave you a real overview of climate change. They can also deplete the ozone layer. Okay? They can cause smog. If you've ever been up on uh, Mill Mountain and looked on a hot summer day, you can see the smog. It gets stuck in the valley. Okay? They can cause acid rain, which is the sulfur that was in the coal, turns into sulfur dioxide. When that gets mixed with water, it turns acidic, H2SO4, and you get acidity in the water. Okay, we can have human health problems, such as asthma, lung disease, other things from things we breathe. Same thing can happen in the water. Okay, we can deplete aquifers. We can have stuff in the water that the, the paper mill may dump some chemicals into the water. Okay, eutrophication is um, when too much fertilizer from agriculture runs off into a stream, and then it runs off into a river, and then it ends up at the base of the Mississippi Delta. And there's so much fertilizer there, what happens is you get algae growing because it's fertilizer, right? And if it doesn't end up on your cornfield and it ends up in the water, stuff in the water will grow, okay? You get so much algae that it crowds everything else out. Then it dies, sinks to the bottom. It decomposes by pulling oxygen in from the water and you get a hypotoxic area, which means there's not enough oxygen in the water for anything to live. And there's huge regions at the mouth, mouths of big rivers around the world where nothing can live because this fertilizer has caused this algae problem.